Here's what I want you to remember tonight. I want you to remember who we are. Who are we as a country? Are we the country that President Barack Obama sees us as, colonialists, oppressors of the world, that are still oppressing each other here in our own country based on bigotry, sexism, or racism? I don't believe we're those people. I, I do know that there are some racist or sexist or bigoted people here. Of course, there is a, a percentage, but that percentage is so small. They say between 3 and 5% of voters won't vote for Barack Obama because he's black. Well, I bet you can find 5% that won't vote for somebody else because they're white or Asian or whatever. It's crazy, but it's a small percentage. To give you some perspective on this, a couple of years ago, there was a poll out that showed 13% of Americans believe that the moon landing was staged. Do you know anybody like that? We're talking a very small number, 13%. That's double the number that are racist. 13% say we never actually walked on the moon. That was a Hollywood soundstage. Okay, I've never met those people before, you know, the moon people. I've never, I've never met anybody who won't vote for somebody based on their skin color. If you want to point out bigotry, how about the 18% who won't vote for Mitt Romney because he's a Mormon? That's 25% of Democrats who won't vote for a Mormon. You want to want to kick down a wall? There's one. But you don't really hear Obama creating a world where there's a Mormon president, do you? I mean, purposefully. I think he's actually creating that world, but that's a different story. Racism? There is racism, but it's a minority. Even of African Americans with the Black Panthers are racist. But that's a small um, minority. The president is supporting the Black Panthers by dropping the voter intimidation case against them. And they're at it again. Now, and I want you to listen to this, watch out, the language is rough. They're calling for everybody to rise up and kill white people. Listen to this. We're going to have to get out of these goddamn streets. And as I said it on National Geographic, I said it, God damn it! if you want to be free, you're going to have to get out here and kill some of these goddamn peck of woods. You're going to have to kill some of these babies just born three seconds ago. You're going to have to go into the goddamn nursery and just throw a damn bomb in the damn nursery and kill everything white in sight that ain't white. So they're threatening violence now. And they're threatening violence in another statement from them yesterday, threatening violence at the RNC. You find all of the video and the audio at theblaze.com. But I digress because I want to talk about what a great nation we are and how people like that are in the minority. Can President Obama really believe that America is a place where you just can't make it if you're different because you have a different funny sounding name or you're a different color? Just in case he really, truly believes that, and he's living in that fictional world, I, I just want to give him a refresher on the best example that disproves his own theory, and it's one that he should be familiar with, his own life. I want to look at his own circumstances here, but we'll not, don't take my word, listen to his own words and decide once and for all, is America a land of opportunity for anyone who tries? My mother and I jumped back with a start and saw a big hairy creature with a small flat head and long menacing arms drop into a low branch. A monkey, I shouted. Lolo drew a peanut from his pocket and handed it to the animal's grasping fingers. His name is Tata, he said. I brought him all the way from New Guinea for you. Don't worry, Lolo said, handing Tata another peanut. He's on a leash. Come, there's more. In the backyard, we found what seemed like a small zoo. Chickens and ducks running every which way. A big yellow dog with a baleful howl. Two birds of paradise. A white cockatoo. And finally, two baby crocodiles, half submerged in a fenced-off pond towards the edge of the compound. Wow, there's a lot there. Okay. Do you know anybody who has an Indonesian stepdad named Lolo with a peanut in his pocket? No. Oh, wait, I have a peanut in my pocket, but my name's not Lolo. Do you know anybody who has a grandmother named Tutu? I don't. Ever come across an elected official named Lolo or Tutu? 
or who's married, you know, named Steve, but married to Lolo or Tutu or has a Lolo or Tutu in there. I don't know. I, I don't know anybody. How about a Tata? Forget Lolo and Tutu. Let's go to Tata for a second. Got a peanut in your pocket? This was the monkey that, that he, he got in New Guinea, remember? And I don't want you to freak out because, thank you, he's on a leash, okay? We'll get to Tata here in a minute, all right? Ever meet, they ever meet a Tutu or a Lolo or a Tata? Have you? No. But he also said he had kind of a small zoo for a backyard filled with ducks and chickens, dogs. Okay, let's stop there for a second. I think there's a lot of people that could relate to, you know, the chickens and the ducks and the dogs. But he goes on. He says he's got birds of paradise. Well, let me tell you something. They're so rare you can't even get them in the United States. And he's got a white cockatoo. The only one I knew as a kid growing up that had a cockatoo was Beretta. And he was on TV. So exotic? Sure. Yes. See, even he thinks so. Have you ever known or met any person or anyone who had any of these things? Ow. Ow. He's on a leash, but he still bites. You want to come get him? Hello. All of these things, all of these things go, he's just freaking out. First time on TV. Um, he had all of these things. I know Michael Jackson had a pet monkey. Do you know anybody else that had a pet monkey? Especially a pet monkey from your stepdad named Lolo who had a peanut in his pocket. Oh, and, and wait a minute. And then there's also the crocodiles. He had crocodiles. Crocodiles are, whew. do you know anybody with crocodiles? I don't. Oh, we got crocodiles here. You know how hard it was to find crocodiles? You have to have a federal permit. So do you know anybody who had all of these things as a kid? We had to find the crocodiles at Animal World and Snake Farm Zoo here in Texas, okay? That's pretty tough. We had to go to a zoo to get the crocodiles. He had one growing up. He had two. And Lolo with a peanut in his pocket. Now, I know Mike Tyson had a pet tiger. But I'm not sure that we should say the guy who's the Jesus juice guy or the ear-biting uh, rapist guy is the way to prove that you're in the mainstream of society. But those are the only ones that I know that had a monkey or exotic animals like that. So that upbringing sounds more like an A&E reality show than a presidential breeding ground. But despite all of this, he became president of the United States. So, Mr. President, I mean, I could stop there, and I think everybody would say, you know what, you're pretty exotic, and we didn't have a problem with it. But, believe it or not, we elected you. You didn't have a normal life. Have I mentioned Lolo Tutu, Tata, the peanut in the pocket? I could stop there, but um, there's actually more. Watch. There, standing astride the road, was a towering giant at least 10 stories tall wow. with the body of a man and the face of an ape. That's Hanuman, Lolo said as we circled the statue, the monkey god. I turned around in my seat, mesmerized by the solitary figure, so dark against the sun, poised to leap into the sky as puny traffic swirled around its feet. He's a great warrior, Lolo said firmly, strong as a hundred men. When he fights the demons, he's never defeated. Hanuman. Ooh. So, we have Lolo, we have Tutu, we have Tata, the peanut in the pocket, the birds of paradise, the crocodiles, and uh, the monkey god. I mean, 18% of Americans don't want to elect a Mormon, but the kid who grew up worshipping Hanuman, the demon-fighting monkey god, is our president. Wow. We really are bigoted, aren't we? Monkey God. This is a pretty incredible American success story, unlike any other success story I've ever heard. And I could stop there, and I think you'd even be more impressed than you were when I showed you the alligators, the crocodiles, the cockatoo, and everything else. The chickens, the ducks, we all had those. You know, chickens and ducks, if you grew up what I grew up, you had chickens and ducks, and you had a dog. But why have a dog? Why just have a dog when you can eat a dog? And away from the dinner table, I was introduced to dog meat, tough, snake meat, tougher, 
and roasted grasshopper. Crunchy. Have you had any of those? Have you eaten dog or snake meat or grasshopper? I mean, one thing we can all unite on is a dog. He had a dog. I had a dog. There, let's leave it at that. No, 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 no. He had to let us know that he had a dog and he ate it. I don't know if he was in the shadow of the monkey god while he did it. If we can elect a guy who ate Lassie, has a pet monkey, Tutu, Lolo, two crocodiles, and uh, worship the monkey god for a while, I think we're pretty open-minded. What do you think? I think we're open-minded to people who are a little different than most of us. But wait, there's more. You haven't even begun to meet the rest of the family. His real mother was a socialist during the Cold War. His real dad was a communist during the Cold War, but not just any communist, a communist from Kenya. When his father beat it and went back to Africa, his childhood mentor was a notorious communist, but not just any notorious communist that could be picked up by the FBI at any time. He was also a communist, erotic, hardcore porn novel writer and poet named Frank Marshall Davis. Do you know anybody, anybody who has that? But wait, he also has the stepbrother. George, who's currently living in a hut in Africa in total squalor. His sister is an illegal immigrant who lives in Boston and in poverty. And how about his friends? Well, he and his friends uh, formed something called the Chum Gang. That's a group of kids that smoke pot, talked about Marxist principles, and just rage, you know, kind of like you, about the stifling constraints of the bourgeois society. And, of course, there were his imaginary composite girlfriends that he later wrote about in his book. And did I mention that he's not black, he's not white, he's black and white. I mean, whoa, are the cards stacked against this guy. An Indonesian stepdad named Lolo, grandma named Tutu, a pet monkey named Tata, Hanuman, the demon-fighting monkey god. Mom's a socialist, dad's a Kenyan communist mentor. His, he's also a communist mentor, uh, porn writer, impoverished brother, illegal immigrant sister, part of a druggy game with a crappy name, and psychotically creating fictional girlfriends in his spare time. And his, his stepfather had a peanut in his pocket for the monkey on a leash, and he's still the president of the United States and the most powerful man on earth. Whoa, if we all just had a peanut in our pocket we could relate. Do we live in a great country or what? What's that? <laughs> the monkey god says yes. Now I'm sure I could stop there. And your jaw would be on the floor, amazed, convinced, yes, whoa. America is a pretty cool place. They're pretty cool with people with exotic backgrounds. But why stop there? Because there's more. This guy was exotic. He was born in Hawaii. Okay, I, when I was growing up, it was exotic to go to Hawaii. He grew up in Hawaii, and if that's not exotic enough, he was sent over to Hawaii from Indonesia, where he spent most of his childhood. And he didn't step, step foot on mainland America for the first time until he was 18 years old. So that means this guy has no childhood memories of the 4th of July. No 4th of July picnics, no Memorial Day, no parades. No, this guy spent his childhood hanging out with Hanuman, the demon-fighting god, and eating dogs and snakes in Indonesia. Did I show you the plate of snake meat? Oh, it's delicious. As long as you wash it down with whiskey or something, is there anything that could make this story even more incredible? Glad you ask. Yes, there is. He was given a perfectly normal name, Barry. He was growing up in the 1970s. We all know famous berries like Barry Manilow, right? Barry White. But he thought, no, I need something a little more mainstream. Not Fred, not Jim, not Ned, not Billy, not Bob, not John. No, he needed one that maybe could get him elected. So he changed his name to Barack. And as if that's not funny sounding enough, he chose the last name Obama. At the time he changed it, it was fine. But when we elected him president, us close-minded Americans looked at that name just one letter off from the most hated name in American history, Osama, and elected him. But if that wasn't far enough, 
This country is so into everybody being exactly the same and so stifling to anyone who had anything different, they went to his middle name, Hussein Barack, Hussein Obama. So he has not the name of one, but two of the most hated and despicable people in the world's history who at the time we elected this man president, we were at war with. Let's put this into perspective. This is a little like trying to run for president in 1943 and having you change your name to Adolf Stalin, Mussolini, Hitler, and everybody would go like, yeah, I can elect that guy. It wouldn't have happened. You might be a great guy, but I don't think you're going to be president of the United States. It happened now. It happened for President Barack Hussein Obama at a time of war. Don't tell me we're closed-minded. If it can happen to the guy with one more time, an Indonesian stepdad named Lolo, a grandma Tutu, pet monkey Tata, pet ducks, chickens, dogs, that sometimes you eat, the snakes that sometimes you also eat, the birds of paradise, the cockatoo, the baby crocodile, Hanuman, the demon-fighting monkey god statue, a mom who's a socialist, dad's a Kenyan communist, his mentor is a communist porn writer, he's got an impoverished brother who's living in a hut, an illegal immigrant at this time in our country who's living in Boston, he's part of a druggy game with a crappy name, he's psychotically creating fictional girlfriends in his spare time, he changes his name to nearly mirror that of of America's most hated and notorious enemies who are currently we're at war with and he's elected Whew. that's a fairy tale <gasps> wait a minute that's what Bill Clinton told us Bill Clinton told us God bless him that's a fairy tale well how could you say that when you said in 2004 you didn't know how you would have voted on the resolution you said in 2004 there was no difference between you and George Bush on the war, and you took that speech you're now running on off your website in 2004, and there's no difference in your voting record in Hillary's ever since. Give me a break. This whole thing is the biggest fairy tale I've ever seen. It's a fairy tale. Actually, it's not a fairy tale. It's really more like a Dr. Seuss book, really. I mean, he grew up with a monkey god statue, and a Pfeiffer Pfeffer Pfeff. And he went to Whoville, and here in Whoville, he heard the Who's singing with their pop guns and bicycles and roller skates, drums, checkerboards, tricycles, popcorn, and plums. And there was Lolo with a peanut in his hand for Tata. America, like every other country, has some small-minded people, but for once and for all, a guy whose life encompassed all of this... Can we just get him to admit that we don't have a problem with people who are slightly or enormously different than us? I think it's safe to say we already have the America that Obama says he wants to create. He just won't recognize it. Does he have a peanut in his pocket? Of all people, he should know that we are not people that are bigoted, that look at people and say, oh, no, you ate a dog? I can't elect you. He just doesn't, he doesn't need to create it. Just recognize it, President Obama. That's why I said at the beginning, I want you to remember the one thing, who we really are. We are decent, open-minded, God-fearing, and apparently sometimes monkey God-fearing people. That's who Americans really are.